In 2012, white-backed vulture status nosedived from near threatened to endangered. This was in response to the fact that there'd been a drastic reduction in the numbers. Just 10 years ago, there were about 10,000 birds in Southern Africa. Following recent events with mass poisonings outside of South Africa and within South Africa and for various other reasons, we estimate now that the population is probably somewhere between 5,000 and 7,000, probably closer to the 5,000 mark, given the fact that in the last 18 months alone, we've already lost almost 2,000, if not more, vultures in known reported poisoning incidents. How do we protect a species that flies completely free of physical boundaries? By making the world aware of its troubles and by protecting its home base, the place where it breeds. Kimberley is the southernmost spot in Africa where the white-backed vultures choose to raise their families. We're conducting our annual vulture chick ringing session on Dronfield. It's a game farm that's De Beers own near Kimberley. And this is our 23rd year that we have been doing this. And this forms part of a much larger program, a Southern African program. And this is just one of the colonies that we're ringing this year. Beryl Wilson is a zoologist who has been spreading her guiding wings over this tagging operation for the last few years, along with the now retired Angus Anthony. Angus managed the drone field for two decades, and he says that this year they have seen the most chicks since they started the monitoring project. We've currently, this year, have 100 working nests, of which at this time 80 have got chicks on, their, uh, on the nest, and we're busy ringing and tagging those chicks so that we can monitor the nesting success. That's big, that's a nice big bird. Working with vultures requires an experienced team. Even this half-grown chick can inflict nasty wounds. And anyone who's handled particularly a, a free-flying wild white-backed vulture will attest to that. They've got a, a bill that they know exactly how to use and they've got a pair of legs which can uh, do quite a bit of damage as well. To ring and tag vulture chicks, they first need to be plucked from their nests. To do this, it's up the tree for the researchers. But this is definitely not child's play. The white-backed vulture's favorite nesting tree is the camel thorn, complete with the meanest of spikes. This climber is part of a group of French and British raptor handlers that come over to help with the annual tagging event. And he has to be careful of more than just thorns. When scared, a chick may open its wings and in windy conditions, it could be lifted clean off the nest. For a bird not yet ready to fly, this is really hazardous. So it's important that the climbers are also experienced in handling vultures to ensure the chick stays safe and sound. Even a four-week-old vulture has a beak sharp enough to do some serious damage to a human. So it's head first into the basket for this chick, which is then given an automated lift to ground level where the team is waiting. They must hurry. The wind is picking up and a storm is brewing. All chicks older than four weeks are weighed and measured, and each gets its own unique SAFRI code to identify it. It's a unique number that's it's on, imprinted onto the, onto the ring and that should stay with the bird for life. To prevent the birds from tampering with their rings and to make them beak-proof, Beryl pop rivets them on. But it's not, it's not a highly visible way of doing it. For more visible markers, the researchers affix plastic kettle tags to the birds as well, called patagial or wing tags. This holds the Dronfield colony code, W on a yellow tag along with the bird's individual number. And because it can be seen from far away, it helps to gather information on the bird's dispersal. From the potential tags, what it does tell us is how many of the chicks actually managed to eventually fledge, leave the nest, 
um, how well do they do after that and how long do they live beyond that which is what we're doing but the thing is we've only started doing these potential tags for the last eight years so the data set is still relatively small. Beryl also takes a blood sample for DNA as this is the only sure way to tell males from females. With vultures, barring bearded vultures and one or two other vultures, there's actually no sexual dimorphism. So the only way to find out is actually to test. Once blinged out, it's back into the basket for this chick and a short hoist to the nest. The handler does a final check to make sure everything is in its place before whipping that protective glove free from that blade-sharp beak. Good boy. Now he needs to get down. Easier said than done, especially with the stormy winds gathering strength. Any misplaced step will more than likely result in a painful landing. Fortunately, this is not his tree climbing debut. And just in time, the storm has arrived. This is just one of the many storms that the white back chick will have to sit out. But like Angus says, anything born in Africa has to be tough. Their feather development is in such a way that top of their, the body and their wings is, is covered by feathers first and then the rest of the body feathers develop later. The feathers act as an insulation layer, so it allows both parents now to go out and forage. Um, and once they're doing that, it's pretty well much up to the chick to, to get his head under the wing if the weather's not looking good and, and cling on. As the storm blows over, it's on to the next nest. But this one is a somewhat thornier task than the last. The nest is directly on top of a black thorn complete with millions of tiny hook prickles that make it completely unclimbable. But Angus has been in this game for a very long time, and he has the solution to this seemingly insurmountable challenge. A simpler one than might be expected too. This equipment is known as the common ladder. Ah. Hey, you beauty. I've been on this this program now for monitoring this, uh, birds on Ronfield since, since 93. When I started, I didn't use a ladder at all. And uh, with my age creeping up, I've looked at ways of uh, doing things a bit cleverer. And uh, it's actually only two, three years ago that I started using this ladder system. Um, and I wish I'd actually started uh, 10 years before that. Some China. And the work that this team and others like it across the country do is vital if we are to face the stark reality that vultures generally, and white-backed vultures in particular, are disappearing rapidly. From a breeding site, the Kimberley area is, is fairly safe. If we can maintain the breeding potential here, then at least we, we know we can put new birds into the population. Once you spend some time with these guys and you realize the ecological significance of the species, you suddenly realize this is something special. This is something that our environment can't do without. If you've only got 5,000 white-backed vultures flying around, it is actually harder to see a white-backed vulture in the wild than it is to see a white rhino, even given all the current poaching when there's 20,000 of them in the wild. So I'd hate to say, look up to an empty sky.